My time is exact. Wait, so is mine. That was my news. I t- what, really? Yeah, like I came in here, I was like, I wish to do the cold open about time.is because I have some exciting news about it. And then you s- stole my thunder by saying the exact same thing. <laughs> I, I turned off automatic time syncing and then turned it back on to force a time sync since there's not a button in the modern Windows control panel, uh, the settings app or whatever they call it now. Yeah, I just, but yeah, I, I have to. Yeah, my, I just have to express my delight that I opened a time dot is and it says your time is exact, which has never happened in the long history of using this website to sync up our recordings. Uh, yeah, so this is the thing that we use to sync recordings when we're remote. And um, mine is always at least one second off. So I yeah. was pretty excited that I got it to exact. I think I've, I've been as high as like 2.8 seconds or something, which is just like wow. I'm basically living in the past at that point. Um, I know. How can also... You- your financial transactions are all off. Oh boy. Don't let's not even talk about that. Um, oh, fair. Speaking of, did I hear you mention control panel? Yeah, I love the control panel. It's my favorite part the of Windows. Windows control panel. Oh God. Like, remember when you like they first added that and then they grouped everything. You're like, oh God, I can't find anything anymore. And then they just got rid of the good parts of it. And now you can't, it's not even in like the little pop-up menu. I have no problem with control panel as long as it is the only thing you need, but and to be clear, I'm talking about old XP control panel, not new Windows settings. The touch based well, so thing that happened with Windows 8, I think. Right. right? Yeah. They yes. Yeah. They added Metro settings app that had like two thirds of the settings you need. Right. And then they left yeah, the control yeah, yeah. panel for all the other crap. Yeah, we, we got pretty deep into that, Ugh. I think, in the window in the ranking of Windows is. Yeah, it was an important part of why Windows 8 blows. Well, I have to tell you something. Oh, is there good news? Are they finally getting rid of the settings app and we're going back to the control panel like decent human beings? I don't know if you're going to consider this good news. Uh, as as much as I have complained about the fact that there are two different settings in mm-hmm. Windows and that you have to use both to do everything, I think there's a yep. worse alternative, okay. which, is, which is that the word is going around that they are fully expunging the old control panel from the next build of Windows. <laughs> Well, I mean, as long as they take all of the important functionality, like all of the stuff that you can't do in the sound settings app that you need from the sound control panel into the settings app, that's fine, right? Which is surely what they're going yes, to do. Yes, that's definitely wouldn't... 100%. They will account for every possible exception. They will move all of the functionality over to the settings app. Right now, I'm taking a really deep breath so I can get a really good sigh. <gasps> <sighs> Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Thanks for having me. Hey, Brad. It's good to see you, man. Yeah, How are you holding up? I'm doing all Things right. Good? It's good to see okay. you, too, virtually. I digitally. know. All of my friends are screens. You, uh, you've you got quite a nice uh, overexposure going on on this Saturday morning. Yeah. If uh, Hold on. You were, you were extremely blindingly white at the moment. Uh, well, hey, not, bad. Not, <laughs> not that anybody can see this, but... <laughs> that's that's not too far from the norm yeah okay uh, fine what with you know never leaving the house now so yeah. um what what's your day count i believe i'm on day 13 it's since i set foot out of this apartment this is 29 wow we yeah we're almost a full month uh last night i was gonna make pizza dough in the morning so we could make pizza and have family movie night last night and uh we ended up I was just like at, at two o'clock. I was like, I'm not making dough. We don't have enough. I can't waste the flour on the <laughs> dough. <laughs> you just got a ration. Yep. Yeah. And our favorite pizza place is doing contactless delivery. Like our local pizza joint does contactless delivery, although they're bad at it. Mm. Um, so I ordered a couple pizzas and like having not eaten any out at all uh-huh. for the last like 30 days, 28 days is the longest. I think we've gone without ordering some sort of external food. Was it like ambrosia? Adult- oh, God. God, that pizza was so good. Did you know, we, uh, have you been getting yeah. a lot of deliveries because, uh, you know, we're in the city on, yeah. on a very highly populated street, plenty of people walking by all the time. Mm-hmm. And for an A, I feel bad about having to order a lot of stuff, but I just need a lot of gear for the stuff I'm doing 
at home for work yeah. right now. Yeah, you need a you need a full studio in the house now. Yeah, so I've been I've probably taken eight or ten deliveries since this has been going on, but uh, oh. they have both FedEx and UPS have both taken to ringing the bell and just dropping the packages on the sidewalk and leaving. Oh <laughs> which boy, is incredible! Like well, I can't I mean, blame they know them. you're home. I can't. Well, it's not like you're not I, there. So that my girlfriend made that exact point because like the first couple times they did that, I was like, "This is you just put like a two hundred and fifty dollars worth of stuff in a little box just sitting on the." A lot of people walk by that door every minute. Well, maybe maybe fewer right now. But then, yes, probably, she, she, yeah. she made the point that, like, yes, they know everybody is in the house right now. So it is probably safe to assume I mean, that somebody's going to hear the bell and immediately come get it, which is what's happened every time. But and also, I cannot blame them for not wanting to interact with people. Yeah, like I, I gave my UPS driver a virtual fist bump because I was out walking with my daughter uh, in the afternoon and yeah. like we saw him and I was like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah. and, but he had his full mask on and the whole thing. Those, yeah, those I'm not, people. I'm not blaming delivery them at all. people are heroes. Definitely man. not. Yeah, it's just um, uh, it's something to be vigilant about. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, we've had we get a lot of packages because yeah. we have a bunch of school stuff coming. Oh, how's sure. your how's can, can we talk about I want to. So first off. We didn't do a lot of questions last week, so we're going to do another question episode this yeah, week. Uh, hopefully everybody's okay. Um, if, if you, if you some, dis- despise yeah. email episodes and don't want us to do two back to back like this, well, then let us know. Yeah, I mean, I'd say we probably I can't imagine we would do one again in the future. Next week, uh, I think we have another special guest lined up. Oh, cool. And we're going to talk about something cool and old. So oh, great. Um, I like cool and old. Yeah. But uh, in the meantime, huh? uh, let's. I want to hear how the studio stuff is like we, we oh, hey, by the way, on our walk yesterday, I saw something really important. Oh, there were two 22 inch monitors oh, from man. Acer on the side of the street. What? I almost grabbed them for you. I was like, what these the are going to be great. Fuck? You can put two more in there. You'll have like one normal size modern monitor. Hmm. Wait, they were what? only VGA, though. So uh, what? Oh, wow. Dude, yeah. Come on. Like even <laughs> even my monitors have DVI on them. Come on. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing analog in here. I'm sure they have DVI, Brad. Should I, I just, I've been dancing around this topic for the last three weeks or so, and I feel like yeah. I should just come out with it, which is yeah. that both of those monitors are sitting on the floor of my living room right now. And I'm going to take you one step farther, and you can do the use. exact same thing that my neighbor did and put them out on your sidewalk and write free on them, and then they won't be your problem anymore. Well, the situation is that I am using temporary work monitors. Yeah. I got a second monitor in here for work. Uh huh. So I'm in a weird limbo where people keep giving me shit about my old monitors, and like deep down, I know like I'm not using those monitors right now. I know, but if you get rid but of the is, old ones when you have to take the new ones back to work, it's going to bring the whole thing to head, and you're going to have to make so. a decision. I guess so. so the reason I've been avoiding this topic is that I want to give people the triumphant feeling of catharsis that they're looking for with a sock <laughs> when I get oh. actual awesome new monitors. But this is this is just a weird limbo right now where I have better monitors, but they're not the ultimate monitors you know what i mean yeah they're good enough but like, they're not right, yours right and people don't want good enough out of this story this long running no god i need catharsis at this point i want yeah, you to yes. turn something on and have it so yes. blindingly glorious compared right. to your old garbo monitors the, the that your eyes are seared out of your skull yeah, and, the, the, and cu- the culmination like, of the story can't just be oh i got a couple of good enough monitors from work and that's it so yeah just pretend, no, we that, need- <laughs> pretend that i'm still using the shitty old monitors for now uh Anyway, yeah. All right. So, how's the home studio stuff going? What what's what's your what's your setup like these days? Because we uh, get it's, a, it's good. Uh, I mean, like, I mean, I've done a hundred things since I've been stuck here to get my you know console capture and and like I'm spending all kinds of time learning the ins and outs of OBS, which are idiosyncratic to say the least. Have um, you gotten a Stream Deck yet, Brad? No, no. You should get I, one of those. It's uh, real handy. Jeff and Vinny both have wired up their own kind of like you, you homebrew. Do, yeah sort of stream deck slash like kind of button interface like Vinny took an old MIDI controller and yeah if you have, set it up if, if you have like a mechanical keyboard that you can pro if you have a keyboard that you can program macros into you can do use that too yeah but the stream deck's pretty so the stream deck is a little thing from Elgato it's basically like a little screen that has some uh, touchpad buttons on top of it yeah uh, so the buttons are it's like a it's like a capacitive screen and the buttons trigger this thing so you can have like little images of whatever it is and you can the neat thing about it for when you're streaming or doing audio stuff or recording or whatever is that you can program really complicated macros that are like two-way macros so like one turns something on and that thing is like five things and then one turns those five things back off 
or okay, whatever so, so does, does setting windows, you want. Does Windows not read those as keyboard presses? Like it's not taking key input for those? Okay. So you can you can make the Stream Deck software make a key a button do a key press. But they, but they don't have want. to be key presses, right? It does not have to be key okay. presses. Re- and the, like, reason, the reason I ask is mm-hmm. um, if you want to get all ambitious and program some hotkeys in OBS or set up hotkeys yeah. for like start stream, stop stream, start recording, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You should really make sure that those aren't the exact same hotkeys that you also set up in, like, say, your music player for play and pause and, like, new playlist and stuff. Yep. And then you definitely shouldn't find that out right in the middle of an important stream that needs to not be effed up. I have a bunch of nonsense in it. Yeah. So that's why, anyway, yes. Like, it's. Did you start playing Rihanna, Brad? No. No, I stopped a stream. (laughs) Oh, no. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) That's like when I. And it happened to be an important (laughs) podcast. Oh, no, that needed to not uh, be interrupted. But I thought I was getting cheeky and going to play some music for the podcast. And instead, I killed the stream and the recording at the same time. Oops. <laughs> anyway. Oops. All right. Uh, um, so so the, the one thing I mean, yeah, I've set up a ton of audio stuff. The one thing uh, and um, special thanks to some of the folks in our uh, Patreon discord for their help with this stuff. I know a couple people might be interested to hear the conclusion of this story. Really seamless plug there, by the way. <laughs> Um, I was taking, uh, I was taking analog audio out of this monitor that I've got. It's got HDMI in, which is what I'm running like the consoles to. Cause I, you know, I need a screen to play a console game on while I'm streaming. Mm-hmm. And the only audio out it has is an analog, the th- just a 3.5 millimeter analog jack. Um, I was running that into both like the line in on my PC and like a cheap USB kind of sound card that I've got. And I was just getting wretched, just nasty electrical interference, you know, whines and, pops and buzzes and just you know, gross you know you know what electrical interference sounds yeah, like it sounded on, like garbage on analog audio and some people uh recommended getting an audio ground loop isolator uh-huh which I don't know if you, i've never had those work for me so like they, that's that's the thing with this uh i finally got it because you know amazon shipping is, is taking a long time right now so it took a couple weeks but i got it and literally just plugged it in line between the uh the the cord coming out of the monitor and the line in on my motherboard yeah absolutely like stunned it is as clean as you could ask for like it removed every bit of it like because you know motherboard uh audio analog audio ports are like notoriously noisy themselves yeah regardless of like if you've got a ground loop situation going on but like the audio coming in on that line in is like pristine like it's i cannot it was a 15 dollar little dongle and so i cannot believe how well it cleaned up that audio like it's just shocking to me so the last time I tried to use one of those was probably five or 10 years ago when I had 5.1 speakers in the, in my office still back in the old days. And the speakers had to plug into a different plug than the PC plugged into and it happened to be on different circuits in the house. Okay. So like my PC and all that stuff plugs into one, one that I had wired in when I built, when we, when we moved into the house. So there'd be enough power in here for all the stuff I wanted to do. That's a brand new clean circuit. And the speakers had to plug in someplace else. Cause I wanted the subwoofer back in the back corner. And, uh, I could never, the ground loop isolator would never do what I needed to do across different breakers. Basically. Okay. I am, I am talking way out of my depth here, but I, by my understanding was that the ground loop happens when they're all on the same circuit. Hmm. Or did I do I have that wrong? Is that backwards? Usually, you can solve the ground loop problem by putting it plugging everything into the same power strip. Is oh, my interesting. Okay, I, maybe yeah. I've got some esoteric situation because my PC is plugged into a UPS and the you, monitor you might have is also, not. You yeah, you might have also had well, so that would definitely do it. Okay, um, but, you might but, also have been getting other noise. So, like for example, if I move my headset microphone too close to my LED backlit mechanical keyboard, sure. I get all sorts of weird EM noise yeah. into the microphone from the keyboard, from whatever electronics are on the keyboard. Yeah. And to be, to and be fair, the, the, I've got a, this is like a 20 foot aux cord, which mm-hmm. like Vinny was that's saying. That's a long 3.5. Yeah, yeah. Vinny was saying a cord of that length is basically just acting as a giant antenna. Yeah. Uh, and it's threaded behind my desk where I've got all the cables routed between like, there's a Raspberry Pi back there. There's a little HDMI splitter. There's a the little USB capture device I'm using. Like there's a bunch of powered devices that that cord is like winding its way through. Well, and USB is noisy too. So like if you, if even if you have a USB cable crossing that has data going across it, crossing an XLR cable, which is really well shielded and designed to not be a giant antenna, you can get oh, USB really? noise across oh, wow. the XLR even. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, power, so I, USB I sh- power is not a problem. It's just data. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, so I, I shouldn't like pitch this thing as a, a you know a one size fits all panacea or anything like that. But whatever whatever specific interference situation I have going on, like I just plug that thing in and it completely cleaned it up. And I could not. That's awesome it. that it worked. Yeah. yeah. It's fifteen bucks on Amazon. Um. So it's funny. I to solve that problem rather than fix the cable routing so that my cables don't cross. I just use a pair of XLR studio monitors that I had nice. and run XLRs around the back of the desk and they just run over everything and they're pretty bulletproof except for the occasional USB noise. Sure. Um, so, okay. So you got the, you got like a Elgato card or something to do some capture. It's a, it's a mage well, which okay. is I kind of not exactly a prominent brand. Everybody talks about Elgato and like, I think black magic is a, a big one in that space, mm-hmm. but like mage well, I think is a little company out of China probably that, Mm-hmm. I don't even know if they make internal cards. I, I know they make these kind of inline USB USB three capture devices. But uh, anyway, the one I've got is like four years old or something like that. That's been working okay. pretty well. Okay. Um, I, I use a, I have a Blackmagic uh, Intensity Pro 4K in my streaming PC that captures input from this from the TV. I mean, from the gaming PC. Right. Um, and that's a that's an internal card. That's I have two of those. One's for the camera and one's wow. for the other Holy other sh- computer. That's well, elaborate. We, we also use them for foo stuff. So oh, okay, um, justifiable. Yeah. yeah, it was a justifiable those, expense. Are those PCI or PCI Express? Those are PCI Express. Okay, I don't have any PCI. I don't think there's any PCI slots in my computer. I, uh, I not surprisingly PCI have Express. been eyeballing the specs of my motherboard a lot more the last three weeks to see what all <laughs> I could could pull off in a pinch. Uh, and my board still has two old PCI slots. Oh wow. So, um, so, so no, the 4k, the 4k cards all have to be PCI express, I think, because of the amount of bandwidth for the video. Oh, sure. The problem, the problem with those black magic cards is they, they don't do gaming monitor resolutions. Ah. So it does 1080p 60, no problem, but it doesn't know what to do with 1440p and okay. it only does 4k at 30 Hertz. I Yikes. think not 60 Hertz. Yeah. So it's not like they're, they're, they're the upshot is. It's pretty easy to do a capture card at 1080p. Like, like the Elgato ones are good. The the Blackmagic cards are great at 1080p 60, but they things start to get weird beyond that. Sure. Um, you just got to get to this the, glorious, fully compliant HDMI 2.1 future, and everything will be fine. It's look, we're getting we're it getting takes, there. It takes so long. I know. It takes so long. I know. Um, but yeah, so that that's I mean, my setup is basically the same as it always has. I haven't changed anything. Yeah, I have the audio interface, which I think we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And and, uh, you know, normal, right. normal, normal computer stuff. Yeah. All right. Should we get into some emails here? Yeah. You want to do some emails? Sure. Like emails. Questions. What's, where did where did these emails get sent to? Uh, oh, uh, we have an email address. It's oh? tech pod at content dot town. That's it's right. just the URL for the podcast uh-huh. but with an at instead of a dot between wow. the ter- first two words that is uh, that's that's fancy when you control the domain you control everything yeah i guess so i've been doing i shouldn't i shouldn't even bring this up i've been dabbling with some powershell scripting recently Ooh. so as soon as you said that my mind immediately went to like how would you how would you like dynamically change out one one delimiter for another how would you, you get in the slash? bash you in the tch the- what's your what's so, your uh so uh, again, I've really, I swear to God, I am not going out of my way to plug this discord, but I have been talking to some folks in there about that stuff. Um, PowerShell is kind of a pain in the ass to work with. Yeah. PowerShell sucks. Uh, so I mean, people who are good at it, it's awesome, but I'm not good at it. So it yeah, sucks. Yeah. Well, it's got some weird quirks. Anyway, uh, the, the, that new windows, uh, subsystem for Linux is coming mm. soon. Mm-hmm. So I think as soon as that happens, I'm going to install that and start switching over to learning to, to do bash scripting and never look back you gotta get up that beard you get yeah. time to grow that thing i know time to make it happen anyway okay you, let's you, let's read some emails yeah. I'm, I'm sorry yeah this is not just my personal stream of consciousness or maybe this, it is. that's what people are here for brad they want to hear us <sighs> talk about the shit that we talk about in in the in the, in the discord chat yeah. all day long anyway big big thanks to those folks for giving me some uh, pretty good actionable info on uh, a variety of things i am looking in that in that domain look I am looking very hard. The Mr. Conversation that is ongoing. Oh, my God. Has me so close. I don't even know if we're going to get through, get to emails. We could just talk about things that have been going on lately. So I got, uh, I got my DE10 Nano in the mail. Oh, you did. You so, you've ordered the parts. Yeah. So what well, else do you have coming? The thing, the so, thing that was stopping me was that nobody had the SD RAM module in stock, which is the thing you need for 
pretty to much make, everything like any neo geo and more than that like GBA i think cores only, and stuff like that the only cores i know of that don't run or that run without the sd ram are genesis maybe pc engine but like okay and maybe one or two like of the we, old computers but like just about sh- every console needs the ram we should explain what the mister is it's a it's a fpga based hardware emulation yeah so uh, an FPGA is a, is a kind of CPU that that can reconfigure itself dynamically. Yeah, to be um, other chips. To be yeah, to to mimic other chips. And basically, what this is doing is, um, it's mimicking old console hardware. Yeah. On a little box that's about the size of like a USB portable USB charger. Maybe well, it's it a little looks bit- like a. It looks the, the actual board is basically a Raspberry Pi. Like in in terms of the way it looks and the form factor, it's that. Yeah. It's a it's an SBC, a small board computer. So then Mr. is a software project that uses a specific FPGA that's pretty available for what, like 150 bucks. It wasn't, it's not super expensive. The, so the DE 10 nano is the name of the actual board people buy. That is the basis of this thing. And yeah, that's, yeah. it's a hundred and the base price is 130, depending on where you get it. Um, the, the whole reason, I don't know if everybody knows this, but the whole reason that thing is so cheap is because Intel apparently subsidizes it pretty heavily. Oh, I didn't know that because like bigger and more capable FPGA systems are like way more expensive. Yeah. So the reason everybody's I mean, yeah. using this thing is because it's so affordable. FPGAs are expensive to manufacture. Um, um, yeah. So the real quick, I just have to somebody in the discord dropped this line and I apologize for forgetting who it is, but it's the most like succinct way I have ever heard to explain what an FPGA actually does, Ooh. which is that with normal software, you're telling a CPU what to do. Mm-hmm. And with an FPGA, you are telling it what, what hardware to be. Yeah. So, like so you're, you're literally saying be the chips that make up the Super Nintendo main board inside this chip like it is reconfiguring itself to like electrically right like at the electrical level it is becoming the chips uh, so, so, effect more or less I think that's a simplified explanation. So, so does that mean I can like if I load up the Genesis core I can figure it I can configure it to be the type of Genesis like the the rev of Genesis that has the audio hardware I'm accustomed to. Um, I don't know if they, I don't I don't I don't know if the core for the Genesis has that level of specificity, but I don't see any reason they couldn't do that if they wanted to offer different cores that had those. But yeah, I don't, no, know, I mean, if people, that, I don't know if people yeah. know that different revisions of the Genesis had slightly different versions of that Yamaha chip, so the music would sound a little bit different. So like, depending on which Genesis you had as a kid, you have a different idea of what the correct Genesis music sound is. As a as a kid, I uh, got a Genesis when I was in college, Brad. Wow. Well, that's okay. We're not all. Look, some, we, some, I played a lot of NHL and Madden. That's not, all I'm saying. It was very our, popular. Not all of our beards are quite that gray yet, but uh, um, <sighs> so um, uh, yeah. So just to expand on that stuff, I don't know if we have have we talked about the Mister much. Is I think this, we should do. Um, are we retreading so, this? We, no, we we haven't really. Uh, Look, we all do a lot of podcasts. I've talked about it on other podcasts. I don't think we've talked about it a bunch here. The reason uh, I ask is it's kind of topical right now because I don't know if... Are you familiar with um, the SNES emulator B-SNES? Yeah. And it's the, we did an article about on te- untested okay. years and years ago and, and when like, it was finished like Hegan or Hi- I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but there's a Hi- Hegan. I thought Hygen. was how you say it, but I, I don't yeah, know. So, so Bu is the author of those things, of those emulators uh, like Hygen in particular is known as like the most accurate Super Nintendo emulator in the world. Like that was his whole his whole goal with that thing was cycle accurate emulation of that hardware. And like, it takes an incredibly beefy computer. So to that's run the thing I had forgotten. Emulators. That's the thing I had forgotten. And talking to people about the 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 Mister and the FPGA stuff, that's that's what really drove home why this thing is so beneficial. Is that is that yeah to get that level of accuracy for just the Super Nintendo, you need like three to four gigahertz, and you're like Multiple maxing cores. it, and you're like yeah, maxing mo- that horsepower to get that level of uh, accuracy, and you're getting the same kind of accuracy on this little hundred and thirty dollar like tiny tiny little thing that takes like no power like yeah so it works i mean the other the more commercial versions of this type of thing are uh, analog a company called analog that's i think in the eu or uk makes um these really high-end like consoles that you can put actual cartridges into that that use similar technology um but but i think this is the kind of homebrew version and it seems like it's definitely like i've been at i've been on upfs and stuff where jeff busted his out yeah. and we played old ti games and oh, yeah, they looked awesome. and felt exactly like i remember ti games so I mean, the, bad they looked bad the the analog consoles that's like the um the the nt mini the <laughs> mega sg the super nt those are the names of those actual consoles yeah um those things are known for being really accurate like their their core development 
focuses on making sure the emulation or it's not emulation, but the software runs accurately on the virtual hardware. Um, but I've seen some people saying that because of the open source nature of the cores on the Mister, they are actually starting to achieve even better accuracy because, like you know, just by nature of so many different people banging on the same on the, the same development. Well, the the people who are really into whatever weird esoteric game that would find an error on something else will go in and fix their problems that right. they find. And yeah, and, and, yeah it's, it's, a, good. It's, it's a pretty exciting project. Anyway, the whole reason I brought all that up <laughs> is that I finally got my package from a well-known electronics reseller that will remain nameless. Okay. And it looks like somebody got the DE10 nano box with a forklift. There was a oh, straight, no, up, like it has a hole poked a straight in it? up hole poked in the top of the box, like pretty savagely. <laughs> Just is the card okay? So, like, based on what I could see, the way things were laid out inside the box, the 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 board, the the actual DE10 was not right underneath where the hole is, Whew. and it appears to I haven't booted it up yet, but it appears to be undamaged. Whew. But like, I, I don't know how that happens, man. That's like frightening that they shipped that out. It did not Look, happen in man. shipping because the outside of the box was fine and it was wrapped in bubble wrap inside, and that was all fine. <laughs> it it had to have happened in the warehouse or before it was packed for shipping because. The actual retail box was just straight up punctured. And are you the sure that UPS the didn't do it and, fine. and repackage? I've had UPS reprint labels and rebox stuff that they've oh, damaged before. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, that's devious. I did not consider that. I, it might have been USPS that I saw did that, but like I've oh, had wow. packages come that like were damaged in shipping. They, and they did, were like, and we used a wanted, new box. <laughs> just wanted to cover their tracks. No, no, no. It was more like they didn't think there was anything wrong with it. And they were like, hey, we want to go ahead and get this to you. Oh, but they but um, they cops to but it. If, they actually told you that they, they, they it? like, yeah, there was a letter inside. I want to say this was from the USPS. It was like, hey, the original box this was shipping was damaged in transit. Okay. So we replaced it with this one. If there's something wrong, here's the number to call. I did not get any such <clears throat> uh, messaging. Also, this was delivered by UPS. Um, yeah, well, I don't know. I feel weird about it. Like, I think it's fine. I, I should boot it up and try to make sure that everything's good. I yeah I would it, just if it works then it's fine if it looks, not I mean it who cares about the packaging but yeah but it's just it's a little it's a little alarming it's not great to it's get not your, what you want to get your new thing in the mail and see it just yeah anyway uh, should we answer a question should we, we, should we we're, we're 28 minutes in I think feel like this is the time for questions even have time for emails at this point okay I don't uh, it's hard to say all right here we go um here is the first email from Adam with a subject line of Regarding poopy Windows 10 blue screen. Uh, in episode 22, Will brought up Windows 10's frowny face blue screen. That's the generic blue screen that you get now that doesn't actually change based on the nature of the error. It's just the it's the same QR code every time, right? That just sends you to a generic landing page. It's sends like, you hey, to something, page. something went wrong. Completely useless. <sighs> this makes me sad just thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, I found that you should be able to change a registry entry to switch back to the classic Windows blue screen with actual information on it. Um, and he included a link and I've got it right here. I don't know if you just want me to read out a registry key right here on yeah. the podcast. Okay. Look, this is the, this is the content people crave. Give, we'll it, give this, me all those good registry keys, Brad. We'll put this. <laughs> how many other podcasts on the internet can you go to for look hot registry flips? Our um, new tagline, the number one source of Windows re- hot Windows registry oh keys. Man. Brad and Will made a tech pod. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes if people actually want it, but it's it's HK local machine uh, backslash system backslash current control set backslash control oh, yeah. backslash crash control. You create a new D word value called display parameters and set it to one. Oh, yeah. Give me those good um, D word values. Anyway, it's a super easy. I mean, anybody that's fiddled in the registry knows that takes 30 seconds to do. Uh, I just think it's ironic that we are actually seeking out the old blue screen these days, considering how everybody used to feel about it. Well, so before I found out about this, I used to use the Windows debugger to do kernel debugging, where you okay. you set the, the blue screen to save a dump or a, or a mini dump, which is basically like the parts of memory that are relevant to the crash. And then you can go in and look and see what actually what actually seg faulted or whatever. Huh. But this seems much better because then you can just look at it on the screen and then type that thing in. Uh, yeah. And have valid information. Yeah, and you can get back to seeing like what, which driver or file caused the error and that kind of thing. So the word I heard on the QR code uh, from an unnamed source inside that 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 is positioned to know 
is that the reason there's only one QR, like originally somebody was like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if the QR code took you to an error for the for the blue screen? And then when they started actually doing it, then the number of QR codes that would be required w- were took a lot of space uh, and, and memory space. And that space is like the kernel has to fit into a relatively small amount of space on the on the in the memory. I'm surprised. Can't, so I'm surprised QR codes can't just be encoded on the fly. I mean, is there not there's got to be a just a standard. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure they can. But then they'd have to have the program then code like. Oh, like if you're trying to fit this all into 640 K or whatever ridiculous, I guess, yeah, I guess that algorithm would have to live in some protected space where it would actually still run after everything else crashed. Right. Yeah. So I didn't even think about that. It it, it sounded like it was, Hey, this was a good idea. Um, then once, once it impacted the reality of windows was not able to be implemented in the way it was originally envisioned. So instead it just became a link to the, Hey, sorry, your windows is broken. Right. How, how hard is it to enable that kernel debugger? <laughs> you have to download it. I think oh, I, okay. I, That's... um, it's, it might be, it might be a default thing. It's win debug win W I N D B G. And, um, you, uh, uh, do, uh, uh KD slash KL to launch it. Okay. Uh, KD dash KL. Space I'll probably dash. I'll probably just make this registry change and move on. But also, I don't think I've seen a blue screen in years at this point. So when you get real into like low latency audio stuff, you're going to see more blue screens because oh, when the timing like, gets out of whack, then they then they bomb out the whole system. And, so. and you might and you might be running drivers that are less than ideal. Look, or, the people who make like audio hardware and the people who write drivers, good drivers, there's a, those vent that Venn diagram doesn't <laughs> overlap at all. <laughs> sure. I bought a. Uh, Speaking of which, I bought a, a USB 3 expansion card, like a PCIe card yeah. with a bunch of USB 3 ports on it just because I'm running out of ports because I'm plugging so many things in now. Have you considered a hub? And, uh, yeah, but I kind of wanted some stuff just right in the back of the PC. Okay. And it was cheap. But the, but that's the thing, though. Then I had to eyeball like, oh, what USB chipset does this use? What are the drivers like for this? Because if I have to go get some no-name driver that's going to make my system super unstable, this is super not worth it. But they said it's got a built-in Windows driver. It's plug and play. So I'm guessing that'll be fine. Has it come yet? No, that's like a month out. <laughs> yeah, well, let me know how it goes. I, I've had mixed results with those. I, I delved into that world when VR was new. Yeah. And I was trying to have two VR headsets plugged in all the time. So I didn't have to go unplug and replug when I was switching between Oculus and Vive development. Yeah. Um, it, it's not, it didn't, the putting a USB card in did not solve that problem. Yeah. I did see and, one, one Amazon review on this particular card uh, said that it, didn't work well with their oculus rift so that's probably a concern but i don't that's not a problem for me because i'm not using an oculus rift the the first gen oculus used a shitload of usb bandwidth and power because Ah. it had two webcams and the headset were all powered by usb so maybe maybe it was just this card is just not doesn't fit with the spec that thing needs yeah the motherboards that were what was it i can't can't remember what the chipset was like um was one gen two generations back now um didn't their usb bus implementation was bad for that so you had to plug like when you added a third oculus camera you had to plug two into usb3 and one of them had to be plugged into usb2 or else it would overload the amount of bandwidth that you had available on the usb 3.1 bus shared between all the devices i'm just gonna make i'm I'm gonna render an opinion here that's too many usb ports to require for a single device i mean they don't sell it anymore for pretty good reason i think Uh, that's fair that's fair I have to say, like, honestly, my favorite thing about the Windows Mixed Reality headset I have is just how simple the setup is. You literally yeah. pl- literally plug the HDMI cable into your video card and one USB 3 port in through the motherboard and you're done. That's it. Well, so that's the way the Rift S works. OK, it's the way the vi- it's the way the index works. Right. I really wish. But does the Rift S have inside out tracking yet? Yeah. OK, the Rift do. S is okay. inside out tracking. Okay, so that's equivalent then, because this thing, you know, unlike the Vive, this thing has no external sensors. I mean, that's literally all you do. You plug those two things in and it uses the built in cameras for the tracking and that's it. Yeah, the um, the 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 index for a while, they were selling a dongle that would let you plug into the USB C port on your NVIDIA card because huh. the RTX, I, I Wait, think it's video, just the RTX cards. USB C ports now. Yeah, the RTX card has a USB 3.1 port that's compatible, USB-C port that's compatible with the VR overall one cable spec, oh, which wow. was part of USB 3.1, I think. Um, but but it's a separate, like it's a $70 dongle and it's Yikes. functionally equivalent to just plugging in the headset to the power and the you know, USB and, and HDMI or DVI or whatever it has, DisplayPort. 
Does that USB-C port on the video card also support, uh, I forget how they refer to the standard. I think it has to support Thunderbolt, which means display, like it can do display port over USB-C. Should, I believe so, yes. So you can plug that into a monitor? I, be- I, I have not tried it, but I believe that that is the case. Do they, what are they still putting two display port ports <laughs> on there as well? I think I have three display ports, one HDMI and the USB-C. Wow. All on that one video card? All I want. Yeah. Wow, Cause it's a double wide video card. That's, that's Genesis. Uh, G- Genesis. <laughs> that's generous. Look, man, <laughs> too much. Now you're, now you're playing with power. Too much Mr. On the brain lately. All right. Let's move on yeah. to another email. Question the second. Um, this is from Martin in London. Day eight of quarantine. Uh, do you guys think the folding at home project will ever achieve anything notable? Uh, it's seemingly the biggest uh, coming together of compute power in history, but it's not making the news that much. Uh, moreover, we've never had a pandemic with the tech uh, humanity now has available to help. Can AI, for example, be useful? I don't think um, we're there with AI yet. That's just my personal gut feeling. Like maybe maybe in some limited cases, there's some like heavy processing that it could. So a, a, the machine learning stuff that we do now is really good at finding unspecific patterns but it requires that you have a good data set to, right. s- to start um i think we talked about this a few weeks ago but so i i don't i don't actually know if folding at home is ever fa- I'm, I'm sure folding at home has done stuff yeah we live in california where if you go above the amount of power that your neighbors are using your rate goes up dramatically for every power every clump of power you're using more than your neighbors so i haven't run a shared computing thing on my computers in 20 years yeah. since, since I moved out of Tennessee. Um, so I, I, I really, I really don't have any idea. I know the SETI at home people never found aliens. I think they did find some interesting stuff along the way. Okay. I, um, like when I look at their, Hey, here's what we accomplished with folding at home page. The most recent one I was able to find was from 2015. And mostly it's about upgrading infrastructure to support more clients. <laughs> okay. Um, and not like, like here's the, tar- here's the diseases they're targeting. Here's the stuff. Like I'm not, I'm not seeing like, Hey, we discovered the way a protein folds that changed the way we treat cancer or anything like that. Yeah. I feel like we would have probably heard about that. Probably. So yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. I'm also curious how <clears throat> folding compares to, say a modern supercomputer cluster that includes a fuck ton of CPUs and yeah. GPUs and is able to do exaflops of data per second. Yeah. Um, Especially I, as uh, more and bigger cores per CPU are becoming a thing. Well, and, and having talked to people at uh, multiple supercomputer centers over the years, like the hard part is dealing with latency in a lot of cases. Huh. So like, you, you you know, Turing machines are interesting because all of our computers are based on the idea that we have like infinite memory and you you have like it's all linear. Right. So we're like a modern computer is still essentially a Turing compatible computer because it all runs on one tape. Like the memory can be a tape, a paper tape that has ones and zeros punched into it. That's infinity long sure. for all intents and purposes. Sure. And with like managing the latency between a million cores so that you, you everything's not just stalled all the time waiting on more data coming in. It turns out is a lot of the challenge of modern supercomputer clusters, like scaling them above a certain point and folding just blows right through that number. So I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I'd be, if anybody's listening and knows the answer, I guess what I'm saying is send it in. We'll talk about it more. Yeah. I'm I'm curious whether this is, whether, whether I, I don't know the answer, wasn't able to find it. So, so what you're saying is that daisy chaining thousands of CPUs together doesn't just work. Uh, no, I mean, they've done it <laughs> like, just to be clear, I don't want to diminish what they've done because the the work that they've done is incredible. No, no. What I to, mean is in terms of just, computing, you can't just parallel parallelize all that stuff and expect it to go. Is what I'm saying. Like you have to do a lot of work to make sure it all actually is. Like work, you have to do together. a lot of work. If all the computers in the same building, if the computers are spread out a lot, distributed around the world, like that's that's amazing yeah. and and is really cool, but I don't know what the output of it is, yeah. and I I don't run it because I don't want to pay more for electricity. I'm cheap. Yeah. yeah. Um. I uh, this. Oh, yeah. oh, go ahead. If you want to do something that you can do at home, the thing to do is to make masks. Okay. <laughs> um, well, actually, that's a good segue into uh, yeah. 
uh, the next question, which I had starred here and I lost it. Here it is. Uh, it's from Eric in Wisconsin. Unless we didn't talk about 3D printing last week, did we? I don't think so. Did I, re- I, I really hope I didn't read this email last week. I think I, I was going to did. and ran out of time. All right. <laughs> Apologies if we talked this about one. this. Time is a flat circle. I can't really keep up so much these days. Eric in Wisconsin. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on 3D printing, the different technologies utilized in the hobby, the use cases you have found, and recommendations for hardware and software. I've considered diving into the hobby in the past, and now my kids ages 7 and 9 are showing interest. So I I thought of that because you're seeing a lot of uh, stories out out there about 3D printing being used for masks and respirators, and like you're even seeing people talking about like valves for ventilators being made in 3D printers in a pinch and some stuff like that. So like it's kind of topical. So, um, most of the home printers are FDM printers, fused deposition model, which means you, you melt something and it gets really hot and goopy. And then you have a nozzle that squirts it onto the layer below that. And it just keeps building up from the bottom. And so does does that Um, still come out with that sort of layered spaghetti look? I mean, uh, the thing that you saw when we worked together eight years ago on the reg is indistinguishable. I mean, is, is, is. Not representative has, has of what a, modern FDM printers can do. No relation to current tech. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a if you have a good Prusa or Ultimaker or whatever your favorite FDM printer is, you can make stuff that has a tenth of a micron. Uh, sorry, a, a micron. Like, y- yes, it will still have. A, you'll still be able to see the ridges if you get really close to it and use your close close up eyes or a magnifying glass. It's much higher resolution, but, is what you're saying. It is much, much higher resolution. And the motors are like the other thing that's happened is the motors are much faster and better. People have gotten better at designing chassis to uh, avoid slack in the end of the motors. So the the movements are more precise and they're much, much, much more better, much better than they were uh, when we were doing a lot of 3D printing stuff at tested even in like when I was doing 3D printing stuff at test in 2015. Yeah. Um, the big change the other thing that's changed is that other types of printers are available i haven't spent a lot of time with these but like sla printers is it sla yeah i think so um sla printers use light to cure a resin so they build um so basically you you uh have a laser that can cure an entire area in the build area in like a couple of fractions of a second. And then it lowers the build platform down. So the models build down into this goop huh. into the resin. Um, and then th- those have there's processing that goes at the end of those. So like you have to wipe them, you have to clean them off with isopropyl and set them in a UV thing to cure. So they get super hard uh, over a period of time. Um, but, but you can build much higher precision at a little bit faster speed with that. Um, we're seeing a lot of, I've seen a lot of people building stuff with FDM printers, I'm seeing a lot of people building like face shield holders. Um, so the things that go around your head and then you can put a piece of clear plastic on okay. that and have a, have That's, an impromptu face shield. That is something I wanted to ask about. Cause I had seen people talking about printing face shields for this crisis, but okay. So the thing I was going to ask was, can you print transparent stuff like that? But it sounds like you need to source the actual mask part separately. So you can get transparent filament, but it won't be clear enough to work through okay. in a medical context, I would think. But but what people are doing is getting the clear, bendy, transparent plastic, right. which is, I think, the part PTFE you wear. or PTG or something like that. Um, and then you you cut that to to size and put a couple holes in it and mount it into your frame. Sure. Uh, the other thing is a friend of mine, Jeff Solon in Chicago, uh, recently posted a uh, uh, design for a laser compatible plastic headband uh printed headband and and frame for face shields as well and the benefit there is that while it may take hours to print one or two or three pieces on a big 3d printer the laser can do all the cuts needed in like two or three minutes for a mid-range you know glowforge or epilogue or something like that yeah and is it is it still the case that if you're, I mean, you probably need to be in a fairly major city for this, but there are still maker shops out there where you can just rent time and go do stuff like that? I'm, I bet all of that stuff is closed right now. Well, if not, you're right, in a, not right now, but yeah. I mean, just generally like that is still a thing or did that? Well, so the, the was, big was, commercial one was tech shop right. uh, and they went under two or three years ago now. Okay, So that, that was my question was if that was just kind of a fad that came and went or if it was an actual um, kind sustain, of, sustainable so, business. 
so the, there are maker spaces. Like the thing that's funny that's happened is a lot of libraries, a lot of public libraries have oh, sure, yes. have put in maker spaces. Um, a lot of schools like the Field Museum in Chicago has a maker space that's available to every every Chicago resident. I should look into that. Like SF has a pretty decent public library system. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if our public library. The thing is, 3D printers are not great for maker spaces because they take a long time to run. Oh, sure. Um, if you if so, what if you want to get into 3D printing, what I would do is look at um, low end, like, like the difference between a low end and a high end 3D printer isn't necessarily resolution. It's speed. So, okay. you know, if you're setting up in the garage and just going to let it ru- let it run and want to have a thing to do with your kids, getting a cheap 3D printer that's slow isn't going to mean you're not able to print stuff and they resell pretty well. Okay. So like you can buy a cheap one, use it for a little bit. If it's good and you're going to get into it, then you can upgrade, sell the old one and upgrade or keep the old one as a way to do secondary parts. Uh, and then, and then move on to a higher end model when you're ready to spend more time or, or money on it. Sure. Um, okay. So, so it sounds like still providing your own hardware is the, is the big barrier to entry. I mean, I think that, I think the library is a good place to start, but if, but you're not going to print something that takes 14 hours at the library. Right? right. Yeah. And, and when I see this, the interesting stuff that people are building for the most part, it is, this is a four or five. I, like, I'm not even going to print something that takes three hours. I don't want to hang out at the library for five hours on a Saturday if I can help it. Uh, there's worse places to spend a few hours, but I get it. Look, I like the library, but yeah. Yeah. The library was a nice place to go when I set up the VPN for my house and I needed an external internet connection. Wait, I walked, what? I walked down you to the library. Testing? I walked down to the library with my laptop and VPN to my house from two blocks away to make sure it was going to work. Uh, okay. That works. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. yeah um real quick uh just because he asked about like just some practical uses like i haven't done this myself obviously but uh are you familiar with a site called my mini factory no i've not seen that i've not heard of that before this is the first time i've been i just got linked to it from 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 the discord again um and it looks like and i'm sure there's a ton of these it looks like a site where people basically upload like 3d print designs and you can pay in this case 1995 and download the design files and print yourself oh that's cool um but in this so, case so this is designs not printing uh it that seems appears like. to be the case like there's a there's an add files to cart button on this design so i'm assuming you pay the 1995 and you get the whatever hmm. whatever format of files you need to load into the program to print anyway it's a it's an ass case it's like a tiny little and a, it always comes back to masses around here but uh it's a tiny tiny little pc case with like a vented like mesh looking front so like good, good airflow and space for a bunch of hard drives kind of close together and like good fan coverage on those. But it's like a tiny, tiny looking little case that would hold like a full on. I'm guessing it's mini ITX. Yes, it's a mini ITX motherboard form factor, tiny little case that holds a bunch of hard drives. Um, so, yeah, that's like 20 bucks for the design. Plus you print and you can make your own little mass case. So, so like, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying more generally is like it's a good way for. Like, you know, there are PC cases out there for most purposes, but like finding the exact thing you want is in, in the exact size you want is not always super easy. So it's, like, so here's somebody that was just like, I'm just going to design my own super small NAS case that you can put in a corner and not have to think about. So the thing I would say about PC cases is that the precision required for those to work right is pretty high. Oh, sure. Um, I'm not sure that I don't know that I would try 3D printing a a case for things that have moving parts inside. Okay. Like I would absolutely without hesitation, print a case for a raspberry Pi or a mister or something like that. Totally. That you can kind of just wedge it in there and it doesn't require like lining up with the mounting holes. And obviously this, like I'm looking at the pictures and there's like a bunch of screw holes and some hinges on it and stuff. Like there's definitely moving parts, but uh, I will say in the description, it says the first 100% 3d printable mini server and NAS chassis in its class. That's truly printable has been printed, has been assembled, has been beta tested by an international team and even modified by others. So I, I think in order, like this is not a good start. What I'm trying to say is this is not a good starter project. Oh, no, no, like, no, no, if, no, definitely not. I'm just saying like this, this is an example of, this is a hard 3d print. Yeah. This is just an example of things that people are starting to use this stuff for. And there's a gallery of people who have printed this and uploaded photos, which is kind of cool to look at. Yeah. So this, this, this site looks like Thingiverse, but it gives you the option of charging for your stuff, which is yeah. exciting. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'm into this. I hadn't seen this. Uh, if you want laser cut Mr. Cases and stuff like that, that's something I can do Ooh, by the way. Okay. 
Um, I, I, so I, I don't have a working three. I have a, I have a three D printer that's not hooked up right now. I find myself using the laser way more than I use the three D printer, just sure. because. I mean, the entry point for the laser cutter is much higher. That they start. I mean, you can get a cheap Chinese laser for like five, six hundred bucks. Yeah, but it's not going to last very long, and it's huge, and it's going to be expensive to get rid of. Um, the glow forges and stuff like that you can get for, I think they start at twenty five hundred bucks, and it is eminently useful. Yeah, we find ourselves cutting stuff a fair, especially right now. We're cutting stuff a lot just because it's fun to laser stuff. I mean, have have laser will cut is the I mean, old saying, right? My my friend Dan, who owns, who's the president of Glowforge, says once you have a, when the tool you have is a laser, everything looks like it should be cut. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which is, see that. is fair. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, Let's see. Why don't we do a couple of old PC emails real Ooh. fast? Uh, Daniel from Los Angeles. I'm thinking of replacing the motherboard and CPU in my old computer, or maybe just building an entirely new PC. What's your preferred method of reselling old PCs and computer parts? I live in a small apartment, and I don't like wasting space. Also, I like money. <laughs> I like money too, Daniel. I've I've never so I so I don't have a good answer for this because this is a problem that has plagued me for the last twenty years. Uh, I have never tried to resell a computer because by the time I'm done using it, it's so old that I don't think it has a lot of value. Although, I, I mean, passed, I guess you could. I guess you can always get rid of something for fifty bucks. I mean, somebody will always find a use for an, an old, like an eight-year-old computer. But yeah, I so in the old days before school systems had IT de- and charities had IT departments, you would the answer to this question would have been go find an elementary school that doesn't have enough computers and give them your old computer because it'll probably be better than what they have. Yeah. But now they all use Chromebooks and iPads and stuff like that, so it's like there's less. There's less um, like uh, your school, your average school IT guy isn't going to take my five year old busted gaming PC. They're going to be like, just recycle that or donate it to a charity or something. You just you just, you just made me worry that we're part of a dying breed of people who cares about buying or building computers. I mean, that's probably not um, true. There's a thriving industry of gaming. I, I D- think DIY that there, stuff, but I mean, I think that. The rise of stuff like the Mister and and the, the like, people making making custom embedded systems makes me not worry. Pe- people have been worrying about that since I started Ars Technica and yeah, Maximum yeah, PC sure. in like two thousand. I'm sure. not I'm not yeah. worried about well, that. Obviously, building your own computer is not going anywhere. But no, we'll we'll be able to do that for a long time. The um, I mean, when the iPad landed, everybody's like, "Well, this is the end of the desktop PC." It has not at all been the case. Yeah. The so I uh, electronics recycling for stuff that's too old to be worth fooling with. Uh, I have all of every old hard drive I think I've ever owned, except for the one that was in my very first Wang is Wang. in a huge box in my garage. I don't I look I just I haven't bothered to pay to have them shredded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yes, I also have a box of old hard drives and old cards, of, you know, various. I don't know if there's any Visa local bus cards in there, but there's definitely old PCI cards and stuff like that. I donated a bunch of my old cards to the because I had a bunch of weird prototype video cards and stuff from Maximum PC days, and I donated those to the Computer History Museum. I think oh, they awesome. only wanted one of them at the <laughs> end. Um, <laughs> nice. So okay, so here's what I would say: if you have a friend or family member, if it's something that's new enough that has value, Craigslist is better than eBay for me as a buyer. Like I don't, I don't generally buy stuff from eBay that's used electronics because I've, you, it's just really easy to get burned. Yeah. So I would advise against selling stuff on eBay for the exact same reason. You don't want to, like, you, you don't, you don't want to hear from the person you sold the thing to on eBay three days later and have them be like, "Hey man, that video card you sold me for fifty bucks doesn't work," because then it's going to eat way more than fifty bucks worth of time dealing with with <sighs> lunatic yeah. eBay buyers. Yeah. Uh, um. Craigslist is good. Uh, donating, like I pass down a lot of hardware, like old laptops go to my parents and yes. they uh, they are thrilled because like a, a three-year-old laptop for me is infinitely newer than what they have. Totally. I have built a, a computer for my parents out of old stuff, although even they are just on MacBooks now. So like you said, a lot of society I mean, has I, just moved on from this. I finally got my mom to get rid of the Dell that she's had. I mean, she hasn't gotten rid of it, but like she's using a laptop now instead of a Dell, uh, like a Dell desktop because she moves around a fair amount. And 
um, it's nice to be able to sit in the living room and use the computer to do her stuff while she's yeah. watching TV instead of being locked in the little computer room that was a laundry room 20 years oh, sure. ago. So here's uh, something I just thought of while we're talking about this, um, which is that I, we've kind of talked about this before, and I don't. We need a good term for it that we have reached. Um, there's some intersection of like the computing needs, like you know, horsepower and memory that like a modern OS or whatever needs, and the progress of that stuff. I feel like we have hit an inflection point where like, oh, the needs of like you're just running an OS for web browsing and email and like the basics. If you're not playing games and stuff like we like cheap, good hardware have blown past those needs. So I would argue me, that happened in like 2010. Yes, totally. So let, me, let, me, let me just kind of let me, let me kind of illustrate what I'm talking about here because it ties into this question. So in 2010, I built a core i7 860. OK, which, which is hopelessly outdated now. Right. Like it's not it's yeah. very it's very power inefficient. It it doesn't have the horsepower you need to do most modern stuff. But what I'm on right now is an i7 7700 K. Which is okay. also getting a little older. It's not totally obsolete yet, but like we're getting to the point where I'm going to need something new in the next two, three years at latest. But, I upgraded but, off of that generation of CPU last year, and I absolutely did not need to. I only right. did it so, because so I wanted. So that's that's where I'm going with this yeah. is that I feel like the next time I upgrade, it's going to be a different situation than it's been in the past. Because in all those cases, the computer I was getting rid of is kind of too old and slow to do much with, or even really want to give away. But if I build like a new Ryzen system next year or the year after, like this, it's not like the 7700K is going to be useless. You know. So like we actually yeah. are finally, I think, getting to the point where like your old computer could actually still totally be repurposed for something or be of value to somebody just because we've passed that point where like your 40 year old computer can still run the current version of Windows 10 just fine. Right. Well, I've I've I mean, we've been at that point for a long time. My the computer that my mom is using at home, the desktop is a machine that I think shipped with Windows 7 and like six eight gigs of memory or something. It's not, it's not a beefy computer and it's fine. Yeah. For when it's um, done. The thing, the thing I've been doing is moving my old gaming PC into the NAS box, right? Moving the hardware from that into the NAS box, which there's pros and cons to that. It uses way more power than you should for a NAS box, Yeah, but it is a really beefy computer. If you want to do something stupid, like transcode video on it, you can. Yeah. The, 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 the thing that happens with those is eventually the CPUs start getting wonky because they run 24 seven for years. Like the, the last one I had was that same generation as your CPU uh, was the generation of. So I went from whatever the six core version of the CPU that you listed first, the A60 yeah. to uh, uh, Broadwell E. Okay. And, and like it was fine. Like I didn't need to upgrade that server at all. Right. I just had the I replaced the the hardware in my main PC and I had a spare motherboard and CPU memory. I was like, well, this one's starting to get a little janky. It's crashing more than I'd like. I'm going to put put more, you know, put the put the new hardware in there. This yeah. Time. So when you say wonky, um, you're basically talking about just the kind of total lifespan of the CPU. Like, I think I've seen what is it like a decade or something is kind of the most you should yeah. expect to get out of a CPU before it kind of goes south. Is that right? That's that. that so in my. In my, what happened to me was actually the memory was failing. Okay. And getting eight year old memory uh, was more expensive than just replacing the, you know, just switching out the other har hardware. It was, it was going to be 350 bucks to get eight gigs of ancient ass memory to well, replace the, the eight gigs that were breaking. I mean, the reason I ask is like, yeah, do you know what's causing that breaking like uh, electrically or at the hardware level? Do you know what is, what is I'm, degrading? I'm sure it's just. I'm sure it's just electrical. I'm okay. sure it's just like the the over time the the transistors um, can't, leakage can't. between trade uh, I, traces on the I, on the memory or something. I see. Yeah. So just kind of materials degradation. Like yeah, over time the those things are running at at reasonably like they're not running at like 400 degrees, but they're running at a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit okay. or 100 okay. degrees Celsius ish. And over time that the hardware, the silicon degrades. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't insult my, I, I could, again, this is a, this is me remembering stuff from like conversations 10 years ago while drinking at CES. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My understanding is that over time, the silicon insulates less well between the traces, but I, I don't know that that's the case. I, yeah. if, please correct me if that's wrong. Um, the good news, if you're running like a home server or NAS or something is that like these beefy gaming cpus that we're using to run our boxes like by the time those crap out or you need something new like the base level like core i3 category of cpu is superior to those in every way well 
And also with the with Linux based systems, it's pretty easy to just pull out the old machine or FreeBSD or Linux based systems. It's easy to swap the old hardware out, do yes. a clean install, and then just connect your data pool and yep. restore the system system set. Yeah, totally, set. totally. Uh, all right, a couple more emails real fast. Except I totally lost the one that I was going to read, so let me just fill here. Uh, here it is, uh, Joey in Burlington, Ontario. Uh, I have a Corsair HX 650W80 Plus Gold certified power supply uh, that I purchased in 2010 that I have used in the various incarnations of my main gaming PC ever since. This thing has stood up to SLI video cards, overclocked CPUs, tons of fans, the works. Ten years later, it is still working well with seemingly solid stability, but it is now three years out of warranty, and I'm starting to get a little nervous about running a decade-old power supply in my main gaming rig. Is it time for a replacement, or should I ride it out a little longer? I guess pretty related question, actually, to what we were just talking about, except about power supplies. I don't, I don't have a good answer for this. Like, I've, my power supply is probably close. It's probably seven or eight years old. Yeah. It's been a long time since I upgraded a power supply. I, I, I mean, I find usually I can tell that power supplies are dying because the machine starts crashing for random reasons, yeah. sporadic. Like, there's no. Like it, it basically like you get it under load and sometimes it crashes and sometimes it doesn't. Yes. Usually it crashes more in the summer when it's hot, when you have a hotter room. Yeah. Um, if your machine's not crashing, if stuff's not acting weird, I wouldn't like if you if you're worried about it being out of warranty, you could buy a replacement and just let it sit in a box in your closet. So it's ready to go when it conks out because it yeah. will die eventually. Yeah. But but um, I guess the I big question yeah. is, like, is there is there any real potential for it to damage the other hardware when it goes? Well, so the way power supplies are designed is that when they fail, they're supposed to isolate, like they're not supposed to surge into the DC side of the power supply. So okay. into the computer side of the power supply. So you should be relatively Obviously, protected there. I mean, nothing, I mean, nothing is guaranteed. Of, nothing's guaranteed. The whole point of the power supply is like if you're if your house gets hit by lightning and lightning goes into your computer, the point is that the power supply is supposed to blow up before the the energy comes in yeah. and fries your computers, right? Your, the delicate parts of your computer. I, I feel like letting the power supply ride is probably not going to hurt anything. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I mean, I'm doing it. That's, that's the, I, I yeah. Mine's getting up there too. Um, the, the only, the only time I ever remember losing a power supply, the way it manifested was that the machine would spontaneously re reboot itself a lot. Yeah. Specifically like when I would fire up a game and stuff like that. So that's maybe one thing to look for. That's, that's uh, so, it's tricky because that's often memory too. Sure. If you remember, because memory tends to conk out after five, four or five years in my experience. Um, especially if you're like talking about high clocked gamer memory, that's maybe not cooled as much as it should be. The, uh, the, the tr troubleshoot, like part of the heart, the hard part of having a computer where you have one computer in your house is when something goes wrong, you don't have a bunch of spare parts around to to swap in and see like isolate exactly what's going on yeah so you know having that second power supply maybe not a terrible idea especially like if you're working from home and you need like a day, a day without the computer is a day without you getting paid yeah you you, you might want to it's maybe worth thinking about adding a, a little bit of, of backup yeah it's a good feeling to have a backup yeah um okay two more emails real fast this one was signed from brad's old monitors I don't appreciate oh. that at all. But here we go. Yeah, floor now. Yeah. Uh, Will, you mentioned living in a about a thousand square foot house. Uh, do you have any tips or advice for maintaining a happy family <laughs> in such a relatively small space? My partner and I are expecting our first kid this year, and we're living in approximately a uh, thousand square feet, though with a big yard. Uh, we both grew up in larger homes with more space and more room. I'm worried we don't have enough space, even though we certainly do. Uh, I grew up in a much larger home uh, with uh, 15 acres surrounding it. So I def oh, first off, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't look. I think the benefit of living in a small house says the coastal urban elite <clears throat> is you end up like your your kid is by necessity going to be more empathetic than they would be if they could just fuck off into the basement and be left alone whenever they want like okay. you have to be what one of the things that Gina and I talked about when we moved into this house and it was just us 10 years ago is that 
because we had moved from a much larger apartment with multiple bathrooms is that like you have to do the things to help each other without somebody asking. Like if you see a mess, we just have to stay on top of mess and clutter and stuff like that all the time. Cause everybody there gets is, out of control. Is, everybody is subjected to the same messes. Yeah. And, and like, you can't be like, Hey, did you see the thing on the kitchen counter? You, you got to clean that up. You got to just do it in advance. And you, you like my daughter knows at knew at four that like when she was done eating, she picked up the plate and put it in the sink. Um, part of it is I like, this is just normal human advice, but it's not tech advice, but just paying attention to the things that make your partner and the other people that live in your house crazy and, and doing what you can to minimize your impact on that. Cause everybody has stuff that makes them crazy. And yes. yeah, like the, the, you just end up being really, really try. You try to be more self-aware yeah. of your footprint and, and your nightmare. Be considerate it's, of it's, the people around you. Yeah, That's, this is this is just not that easy. revolutionary advice. One yeah. simple trick for cohabitating oh, with other God. human beings. But I mean, uh, and and then the kid. The nice thing about the kid is that ramps gently. So the bad thing that we've done, and I don't really regret it, but it is frustrating, is that like we have a bookshelf in our dining room. You've seen it. The toy yeah. bookshelf in our dining room is like my daughter's bedroom is very small. She, we have a big bed in it, so when guests come, they can stay with us. And, you know, she either sleeps in a sleeping bag in my office or in with bed with us. And it means that she doesn't have a lot of room to play or like for a big shelf full of toys in her bedroom. So that shit's all in our dining room. Sure. And like, it's not ideal, but it works. Yeah. Like you have to make, comp- you have to pick and choose where you're going to have your compromises and where you're going to hold firm. Sure. Tell your in-laws and your, and your family not to get a bunch of fucking toys though. Oh That's man. The- this really is just my stream of consciousness. Yeah, let's this do it, week, man. We're we're this, this deep in already. This just popped into my head. Um, do you have any tips on repairing an air mattress? Uh, just buy a new air. Is it oh, one of the no. ones with the motor, or is yeah, it so like it's, one? It's, you have a, to... it's a nice one that is relatively new and hasn't even been used much, and has is fully it, motorized and everything. And let's say we left it out in the floor, rolled up, but it, uh, exposed. Oh no! While a it got brittle. Of, no, while a couple of small rodents were being allowed to roam freely, you got pigged, and one of them, thought, <laughs> one of them thought that it looked like something that would be fun to take a bite out of. It's mm. a tiny, tiny, tiny little puncture hole. It came. Your it, the mattress came with a kit that has the right glue for the material f- the mattress I, is made out I of. I don't think this one did. I, I read they always I, do. when I well, we must have tossed it then because I I googled and I couldn't find that this model came with the patch kit, but. If it did, we threw it out. I um, don't know where it is. I, I ordered, there's a bunch of like vinyl seal, vinyl repair, kind of chemical adhesive, super gluey type things out mm-hmm. there. I ordered one of those for six bucks. The Amazon reviews seemed pretty glowing unless those have been manipulated that this works. So make sure, find out what material the mattress is made out of and then match the kit to that. If it's a vinyl kit, oh, use a vinyl kit. Shit. Because the, sh- the, the glue... Glue's hard. Okay. I like, should have, maybe I should have done my research a little better. I assumed this thing was vinyl. Well, I mean, it probably is. Our, the one that we have is vinyl. Um, j- <laughs> just, you just make sure, because if you use the wrong, gl- wrong glue, I mean, in, in some cases they don't even use glue. They just use solvent that melts the top few layers and lets you like rebind atoms at a real molecular level. So it's not even glue. It's just like, dissolving bonds and then letting the bonds reform when the solvent dissolve uh, uh, evaporates okay the uh you, you if you use the wrong glue it'll melt all the way through and it'll fuck up the thing much much worse Yikes. if you use the right glue it'll probably fix it for a while i i've not had fantastic luck fixing holes in oh, vinyl, that's that's uh, not air mattresses. that's not encouraging at all it uh, also depends on where it is like if it's in a place that's flat that'll be easy if it's in a place that's on a bend then you're boned probably it, it is a place that creases when we fold it up so that, that might be i mean look it, you, it's not going to make it worse by trying to fix it no definitely not yeah uh, that's just very frustrating <laughs> just make Stop. the make the guinea pig sit there with her paw on it and hold her finger over the oh, hole anytime don't worry. somebody's don't, don't worry her her criminality has been discussed heavily over the last couple of days <sighs> Which 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 pig which pig, which I'm which not, which which I'm not you're gonna not name names. I'm not gonna put any guinea pigs on blast here. But wow, uh, Coughlin's number eighty eight eighty air stop is the stuff that I bought. 
Yeah, I, I, mean, I feel let like rip. Let, any, yeah. anything that's named after like the guy who founded the company and has a number in the product name, I feel like is going to be hardcore. So that's what can, <laughs> all uh, your best glues have a number. Yeah. I like uh, Super 77. That's yes. a 3M product. Totally it's great. You glue all sorts of stuff to stuff with that. Air mattresses is the first thing on the package listed. It says uh, small repairs of air mattresses, ground sheets, rainwear, pools, boats and toys. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, hopefully you're not going to make it worse. Yeah. You're right. This packing tape over the hole has not been working out. <laughs> All right. No packing. No. Yeah. It's not not airtight in my experience. Okay. Last email. Um, I'm going to keep this one anonymous by request. Uh, but this okay. person, this person is an MD MPH at a major hospital. Like Neil Patrick Harris? Uh, no. MPH. Oh. Oh, oh, I thought you were talking about, I thought they were very young and they were Doogie Housering, maybe. I believe that is Masters of Public Health, not Neil Patrick Harris. Not uh, Neil, Neil Patrick, Neil Patrick Harris. I thought, hmm, this is, this whole bit is really awkward now. <sighs> yeah, okay. Uh, anyway. Uh, anyway, this person does seem to be quite credentialed, so I feel pretty good about this information. Um, I really enjoyed the latest episode on coronavirus. Also, this is a coronavirus email if you don't want to, if you're done with that. If you're looking to escape, then we're can't. not going to do anything else good for the rest of this episode. Yes, this is this it. Is it. So you can we're going to talk about the Patreon. You should sign up for the Patreon. It's at uh, patreon.com slash tech pod. Yeah. Uh, so and if you don't want to hear about coronavirus, you can uh, go now. We'll see you next I think week. This Thanks is this listening. is really good information for people to have, though, as uh, testing yeah, uh, yeah. As, as testing is in the news more and more. Uh, I found this stuff pretty edifying. It, it's important background for how the tests work and why the different ones are important yeah. that we didn't get into last week or maybe made errors on. Yeah, Uh, he says, yeah, I enjoyed the latest episode on coronavirus and its effects on society and economy. Uh, However, I have to make a correction uh, to your statements about PCR and serologic testing. Okay, here we go. It's it's a a bit of info, but um, PCR testing is an extremely important component of detecting infectious diseases. Uh, At the hospital where I work, we run PCR tests for influenza and another common virus in children called respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. Uh, whenever they are admitted for a respiratory illness from the emergency room, this test comes back in one to two hours, much faster than the 24 hour turnaround time quoted in the episode. Uh, our current COVID-19 PCR test outsourced to a local lab with deliveries from our hospital being made several times per day takes about a day to come back because we have to wait for the sample to go to the lab test to be run and then results to be sent back to our medical record system. In short, PCR is very fast Uh, The main downside it has is that it can't differentiate viable virus, in other words, capable of causing infection, from the remnants of dead virus that has already been inactivated by a person's immune system, heat, or other factors. PCR is generally very sensitive and specific, meaning that it has very few false positives and false negatives depending on the test in question. Okay. With with me so far? Yeah, I gotcha. I used to do PCRs when I was in, uh, I feel like. Uh, in college, but it was different than what they do now. Okay. So yeah, PCR is looking for traces of the actual virus. Yes. Okay. Next, next second, second half of this serologic testing is important and it can tell you if there's an acute immune response to an infection and, or a prolonged immunologic memory of a past infection. Most tests involve testing for two molecules called immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin G. Uh, I will refer to them as M and G (laughs) from here. Okay. Uh, M is usually a marker of acute infection, while G means that there was an infection in the past that your body remembers, meaning that it should be able to recognize the infectious agent again in the future. Uh, uh, Acute infection means you are actively actively sick sick, at the moment. Actively infected. Okay. Uh, An example of this would be varicella or uh, chickenpox. Uh, Someone who's had chickenpox or received the vaccine will have G antibodies present, but M antibodies absent. By Mm. contrast... Someone with an active chickenpox infection, blisters and fever and all, would probably have M present, but G present only later, closer to when they're recovering. Uh, There are exceptions to this G-M division, but for most of diseases, this is how it works. Uh, Serologic tests aren't necessarily faster. They probably take uh, a similar amount of time as PCR tests. We get some serologies back in hours as well. The bottom line is that both tests are important, but in the acute phase of this pandemic in which we need to find people who have viral particles somewhere in their upper respiratory tract, PCR is, in my opinion, the more important test right now and the one being focused on by most testing labs and public health departments. Uh, And that's pretty much it. So 
There we go. That's super good info. Thank yeah. you so much, yeah. uh, anonymous so, listener, so, for yeah, sending so, that so, in. So PCR are looking for people who are actively sick, or or at least have traces of the virus okay. present. But it seems like yeah. it seems like the serological testing is going to become more important later, in like in a later phase of this, when we need to start figuring out who has had it. Well, I mean, they're already looking for people who have been sick and recovered that they can harvest antibodies from yes. to give to the sickest people, yeah. I think, in yeah. New York and other places. Uh, so. But also in just in terms of, you know, they're talking about there being a lot of people who are borderline asymptomatic. Yeah. That don't actually know they've had it. Like you're going to need to identify those people as well and know that they are presumably Look, this, presumably fairly immune and actually safe to maybe go back out into society. This is... uh a thing I was joking about with people on Twitter weeks ago where the people who quarantine and just stay quarantined forever are going to become one faction in the <laughs> after times. Oh boy. And the people who got sick and got better are going to be the other faction. And you're going to be able to tell us apart from our beards. I don't like where this is Because if you're in quarantine, you got to not have a beard. So the mask works. And if, and if you're a post infection scab, then uh, yeah, this is, this is too dark. Sorry. This is that that is that is way over the Mad Max threshold. Let's just yeah. <laughs> let's pull it back a little bit for this week. Um, uh, so I guess that'll do it for us this week. Yeah. Uh, if you have questions, you can send them to techpod at content dot down. Yeah. If you would like to tell your friends about the podcast, which we love, it's our favorite thing in the world. Is when we see people saying, "Hey, I this is there's this great podcast I listen to. I should tell my friends." Yeah. Uh, you can tell them where to find it at techpod dot content dot town yeah and and, um, and always love suggestions on what we have been talking about what you would like us to talk about what you want us to stop talking about uh, yeah. I, would, I would love to i would just love to know what uh i think we're gonna start posting hear more um when when we when we plan out far enough in advance to have next week's topic well in advance um i think we're gonna start posting that stuff in the discord Okay. So that people can find out and you can get access to the discord by signing up for the Patreon. Yep. Uh, the address for that again is patreon.com slash tech pod. If you have signed up and you do not have Patreon access, uh, discord access yet, please, 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 please mash that message button on Patreon. And I will help you. One of us will help you figure out how to get uh, in because it seems like the Patreon to discord syncing process kind of sucks. We, we have, uh, I mean, we have a, several hundred backers we've only had a handful of people that have not been able to connect yeah. but i definitely have had some people that through no fault of their own have not been able to connect and we want to get you in there if you're if you're if you're supporting the show we're up to 300 patreon that's pa patron that's, patrons that is Brad, that's, that's awesome yeah super super yeah. grateful for uh everybody's support and and all, again not, not, i know i just keep broken record here but just the amount of knowledge that, that this group of people has is just absolutely astonishing um as we have been doing Let's see. This week we added. Uh, I think that's we. Uh, the only one thing we added this week was food and other things that you put in your mouth. Yes. Yes. Food and other things we eat. But yes, the channel the channel list is slowly growing there. So that's fun. Um, we, I mean, we're managing it. We're 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 paying attention to what people are talking about in general. And when it gets too too in the weeds, we just add a new channel and yep. and move the conversation in there. We have which that is power. What I think. Yeah, I think we need a gaming channel probably is my guess because people are talking about games a lot in the general channel, but maybe general is just games. I don't know. We are as gods when it comes to creating channels on the Discord. We are the alpha and the omega. <laughs> we are the creators and the destroyers of channels. Yeah. Um. Hey, thanks for... It was good to talk to you, Brad. Yeah, it was fun. It's nice to see every some, week, man. Some social interaction here and there. It's Who, who would have thought? Yeah, I mean, I know you guys are absolutely just like the amount of stuff you are producing on giant bomb on the reg right now is incredible streaming. Um, yes, just getting on there and streaming. I dug out my Wii U yesterday. Ooh, what'd you play? I played super Mario 3d world, which is a fantastic, is a very game. good video game. It's a very good game. I've, I've been thinking about digging out the Wii or the Wii. I mean, we had the Wii U is still connected. I was thinking about digging it out so I can t introduce my daughter to galaxy, but okay. I'd have to find a sensor bar someplace. Well, if you can hold out, you know, word on the street is that stuff might be coming to a switch near you at some point. I don't, I think I'd rather not pay for, well, I mean, it'd yeah, be that's nice fair. 4k, I guess. Yeah. Hey, or, if you want 1080p, if, whatever, if you, if you want Mario galaxy in 4k, that can be attained. <laughs> there are options. God, do I want my, I, Oh wow. Yeah. I have dolphin. And I, I ripped the ROMs for my Wii before I put the Wii in the, in the garage. <sighs> you're, you are legally entitled to play that game on your computer. I believe. Yeah. That, that does, that does read. Yeah. And uh, as always, a uh, huge thank you to our executive producer level patron, David Allen. Thanks, David. See you all next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.